This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo, sponsored by Amazon, Audible, HostGator, Gamefly, and supporters of independent media like you. Welcome to the Humanist Report. My name is Mike Figueredo. This is the 31st episode of the podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by all of our sponsors of The Humanist Report. We have Shane Dean, who is our latest VIP member on TheHumanistReport.com. We also have Nanad K, who donated to The Humanist Report recently. Thank you guys so much for signing up. Uh, If you want to become our patron on Patreon, I'll put a link in the description box. Also, you can support us on HumanistReport.com. On today's episode, I'm going to be talking about mass incarceration. There's a lot of misinformation going around about this subject and I wanted to finally address it. Also, I'll be talking about Dan Savage, who is a gay columnist and a gay rights activist. So he tried to scold a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters for a very specific reason. I'll kind of get to that. Also, uh, lots of topics to cover. Uh, New York Times demanded that Hillary Clinton release her transcripts to Goldman Sachs. There's a lot. (laughs) So uh, stay tuned. In the 1990s, when Hillary Clinton was talking about gang violence, she used the term super predator, which is a racially loaded term. It's basically a euphemism for black youth. Uh, And it's now coming out of the woodworks. A lot of people are seeing it, and it's really controversial. Uh, I'm going to play the clip of her saying that. I'm just showing you that she said the word. If you want the full context of what she was talking about, I'll put a link in the description box. But here's what she said. Not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. Now here's why this word is offensive. So due in part to the increase in crime and arrest trends, in part to the media obsession with juvenile violence, the phrase juvenile super predator entered the public consciousness. Juvenile super predators were characterized as ruthless sociopaths, Youth with no moral conscience who see crime as a rite of passage, who are unconcerned about the consequences of their actions. Some even argued that this new breed of offender had different DNA than their predecessors. The argument went that violent juvenile crime was increasing and would continue to increase because this small group of juvenile super predators commits more vicious crimes with higher frequency than delinquents of past generations. The supporters of this argument concluded that the rehabilitative approach of the juvenile justice system was wasted on these youth because their natures were largely unchangeable. Deficiencies of earlier generations were attributed to factors that could be changed with appropriate intervention but this new breed of juvenile super predator was so disturbed that change was unlikely. As a result, rehabilitation would be ineffectual. Protecting the public from these vicious juvenile criminals became the primary concern of juvenile justice policy makers. So when people talk about the super predator, they're referring to black youth and it's a myth. There's no such thing as a super predator. It's a way to dehumanize black children, uh, and it's just something used to make white people afraid of black people. It's bullshit. Now, given the fact that Hillary Clinton used this term, Ashley Morrison, a protester, paid 500 bucks to get into a private Hillary Clinton speaking gig, and what she did was hold up a sign of what Hillary Clinton said, and she wanted to confront Hillary Clinton for her use of this term, and she also wanted to confront Hillary Clinton about her role in mass incarceration. Take a look. There's more work to be done, but you gotta lay down these markers, you gotta build toward uh, common sense uh, gun reform, criminal justice uh, uh, reform, and all the like. So, I think we've got a very, uh, I think we've got somebody saying here, we have we to want bring to them to heal. Okay, we'll talk I'm about I'm not it. a super predator. Okay, fine. We'll talk about it. Do you apologize to black people for mass incarceration? Well, can I talk? And then maybe you can listen to what I say. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Um, There's a lot of issues, a lot of issues in this campaign. The very first speech that I gave back in April was about criminal justice reform and about predators. You're being rude. That's not appropriate. This is not appropriate. Yeah, you want to hear the fans who just want to talk. I know that you okay. called black youth You're super predators in 1994. Let, let, Please let, explain let, to let the record. Speak. Explain yeah. it to us. You owe black people an apology. Well, Excuse us. That's an inappropriate I'll tell you what, if you will give me a chance to talk, I'll, I'll approach your side. You know what? Nobody's ever asked me before. You're the first person to ask me, and I'm happy to address it, but you are the first person to ask me here. Um, okay, 
Back to the issues. Yes. Thank uh, you. The issue is that I now that is what you call a bad way to handle the situation. So I don't know if you caught that, but she's saying I'm happy to address your concerns as she watches Ashley get escorted out. Are you really happy to address her concerns? Because if so, you wouldn't watch her leave. You would say, no, stop. You tell the Secret Service to let her stay there, but you were happy to let them uh, escort her out. So apparently you weren't happy to address her concerns. And the most egregious part came at the last moment there. I don't know if you caught it, but she said, now we can get back to the issues. Now you can get back to the issues? The crowd treated her absolutely terribly, and of course they didn't want to hear what an African American had to say because this is what they look like. It's all rich white people who were there at this event. But this is a real issue, and Hillary Clinton played a role in mass incarceration, so I think that Ashley deserves an explanation. Now here's what Ashley said and why this individual decided to do this protest. I wanted to bring her to confront her own words. We did this because we wanted to make sure that black people are paying attention to her record and we want to know what Hillary we are getting. Hillary Clinton has a pattern of throwing the black community under the bus when it serves her politically. She called our boys super predators in 96. Then she race baited when running against Obama in 2008. Now she's a lifelong civil rights activist. I just want to know which Hillary is running for president. The one from 96, 08, or the new Hillary. Now within the next 24 hours, the hash Hashtag which Hillary began trending on Twitter and it became the number one trending topic. It basically forced Hillary Clinton to respond and here's what she had to say. In that speech, I was talking about the impact violent crime and vicious drug cartels were having on communities across the country and the particular danger they posed to children and families. Looking back, I shouldn't have used those words and I wouldn't use them today. Now was that a satisfactory response? Well according to Ashley Williams, no. Here's her response back. Apology not accepted. Statement from activists who challenged Hillary Clinton on race last night. Last night, I confronted Hillary Clinton with her own words. She used those words to frighten the nation with dog whistle racism by referring to at-risk youth as super predators. While Clinton's choice of words in that speech were racist and offensive, it is the impact of the policies that she vigorously championed that should give us all pause. She owes the nation an apology for using her position of power to enact criminal justice policies which have been roundly denounced as failures. Here's the truth. The Clinton legacy has left our prisons bursting at the seams. Real lives have been destroyed as a result. It is an indisputable fact that millions of black people were locked up for drug crimes and provided the bodies for the expansion of the prison industry. The 1994 crime bill that she so vigorously defended not only expanded incarceration, but stripped funding for college education from prisoners. The Clinton legacy allowed for policies that prevented anyone convicted of a felony drug offense from receiving food food stamps, or income assistance. Clinton-led welfare reform fundamentally ripped apart the social safety net. Hillary Clinton did not misspeak. She acted vigorously to support policies that this country now struggles to undo. She must own her role in the political disaster that befell black communities as a result. Make no mistake, Hillary Clinton's efforts to push these policies resulted in continued destruction of black communities and the swift growth of our mass incarceration crisis. I held Hillary Clinton responsible for this damage, and that is what she owes black communities an apology for. Now here's the bad part. That hashtag I told you about, which Hillary? Deleted off Twitter. Now the account that started this hashtag, Gorilla Dems? Banned. That's right. Twitter shut down this hashtag. And do you want to know why? See, the executive chairman of Twitter, Omid Kordestani, just did a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. So we need to push back and we need to continue with this hashtag. We got to get it trending again because I don't think that Hillary Clinton's answer was satisfactory and neither does Ashley. This is just all around really troubling. But in the end, getting back to the story, kudos to Ashley. Phenomenal job. Uh, right there with you. What is the role of the Clintons when it comes to mass incarceration. So The Atlantic explains, in 1992, when Bill Clinton flew back to Arkansas to oversee the execution of a mentally retarded African-American murderer, the move helped him in New Hampshire's Democratic primary. In 1994, Clinton's crime bill, which among other things, expanded the death penalty, encouraged states to lengthen prison sentences, and eliminated federal funding for inmate education, garnered the votes of every Democratic senator except one. 
Now, Bill and Hillary Clinton are not unilaterally responsible for mass incarceration. I think it actually would be unfair to solely attribute it to them, but it is important to know their role and how mass incarceration got started. So it started with Nixon's war on drugs that each subsequent president continued, and Ronald Reagan played a huge role as well. Slate explains that Reagan engineered passage of 23 other anti-crime measures, including dilution of the insanity defense, oppressive forfeiture laws, abolishment of parole, and mandatory minimum sentences for offenses involving weapons, not to mention the Sentencing Reform Act. So when you look at data, the trend is evident. There is an explosion of mass incarceration with the onset of the war on drugs. And now when the private prison industry came to fruition, it became lucrative to lock people up, which obviously had a huge impact on mass incarceration. Now when you talk about mass incarceration, you have to talk about the racial implications. So when you look at the facts, African Americans and Latinos were disproportionately impacted by these laws. Now I added the white percentages to show you how much of the population each of these racial groups makes up. So even though African Americans make up less than 13% of the total population, their incarceration rate is nearly six times higher than that of whites. And when you look at Latinos, again, they make up a really small segment of the population, yet they are a lot more likely to be locked up than white people. So when President Clinton signed this bill into law, it was already the case that mass incarceration was an issue, but he certainly contributed to it. And uh, this crime bill was huge. So the question is whether or not the Clintons knew this would lead to mass incarceration. Nobody can say for sure. Nobody can read their minds. But when you take into account the fact that it was politically expedient for them to do this, for Bill to appear tough on crime, well, you can make your own conclusions based on that. So Bill Clinton basically campaigned on it. And this is what Hillary Clinton said when she was lobbying for this bill. With respect to the crime bill, I think as more Americans focus on the fact that this bill would have put more police on the street, would have locked up violent offenders so they never could get out again, uh, would have given more prison construction money available to the states and uh, as well as the federal government, but also would have dealt with prevention, giving young people something to say yes to. Uh, it's a very well thought out crime bill that is both smart and tough. Now to be fair to both of them, Bill Clinton regrets this bill and he states that he had a direct role in contributing to mass incarceration. Hillary Clinton is now against this bill too. But I find it really difficult to believe that Hillary Clinton is actually going to put forth a substantial effort to stop mass incarceration, given the fact that she took money from the private prison industry and was forced to give it back once she was uh, got scrutinized for it. And furthermore, she's still not in favor of legalizing marijuana. If you don't do this, then there's going to be a problem because even though white people smoke marijuana at the same rates as African Americans and Latinos, guess what happens? Well, African Americans are four times as likely to be arrested for marijuana. So if you really want to make an effort to end mass incarceration, you gotta end the private prison industry. You have to get on board with legalizing marijuana. So no, it's not the case that the Clintons are single-handedly responsible for mass incarceration in the United States, but let's know that they did contribute to it heavily. In fact, The Atlantic explains without those policies, Hillary probably wouldn't even be a presidential candidate today at all. This is because Bill Clinton was elected in part due to this bill. So without Bill Clinton, you have no Clinton legacy. Without the Clinton legacy, you don't have a Hillary Clinton presidential candidate. Now, even though they've come around and acknowledged their role in mass incarceration, there was one person who knew the consequences. Mr. Chairman, how do we talk about the very serious crime problem in America without mentioning, without mentioning that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world by far, with 22% of our children in poverty and 5 million kids hungry today. Do you think maybe that might have some relationship to crime? Jim, all the jails in the world and all the executions in the world will not make that situation right. We can either educate or electrocute, we can create meaningful jobs, rebuilding our society, or we can build more jails. Mr. Speaker, let us create a society of hope and compassion, not one of hate and vengeance. Now, Hillary supporters are going to hit back and say, Mike, Bernie Sanders voted for this bill. So it doesn't matter what he said, but you have to know why he voted for it. There were two provisions in it that he liked. So there was a violence against women provision, and there was also an assault weapons ban. Here's what he had to say. I have a number of serious problems with the crime bill, but one part of it that I vigorously support is the Violence Against Women Act 
We urgently need the $1.8 billion in this bill to combat the epidemic of violence against women on the streets and in the homes of America. Now, a 1991 version of this bill, the Biden Thurmond Violent Crime Control Act of 1991, which is a similar version, actually got defeated uh, in the House. It passed the Senate, but it died in the House, and Bernie Sanders voted against this. It was basically the same exact thing. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to the McCullough Amendment, and in fact, in strong opposition to this so-called crime prevention bill. Mr. Speaker, let us be honest, this is not a crime prevention bill, this is a punishment bill, a retribution bill, a vengeance bill. My friends, we have the highest percentage of people in America in jail per capita of any industrialized nation on earth. We've beaten South Africa, we've beaten the Soviet Union. What do we have to do? Put half the country behind bars. So when this bill reemerged in 1994, they wanted to tie the hands of progressives who were worried about mass incarceration like Bernie Sanders. So what what did they do? They included these provisions. Uh, but the reason why they did this was so that way they can say, look, this person voted against the uh, Violence Against Women Act. Don't elect them. So you don't have to believe this. I personally believe that Bill Clinton was smart enough to discern the fact that Mass incarceration would probably be a consequence of this bill, but it was politically expedient for him to pass this bill. It helped him get elected. He was trying to keep his promise. So when you're trying to get elected, when you're trying to run these political campaigns, you don't have time for facts, right, Bill? I mean, when you're making a revolution, you can't be too careful with the facts. <laughs> So that's the facts. I thought this would be helpful to talk about this, uh, given the fact that mass incarceration has been a huge issue in this campaign as of late. Uh, and just note that this is like the Cliff Notes version. Like, the whole story is very deep. It's nuanced. So I'm basically glossing over a lot. But these are the main events in uh, the story of mass incarceration in the United States. Hopefully you guys found this helpful. Dan Savage, a well-known gay rights activist and columnist, decided to scold Bernie Sanders supporters because they had the audacity to point out the fact that Hillary Clinton has a terrible record on LGBT rights. Now, I'll just preface this entire discussion by saying that I'm a big fan of Dan Savage. I have an immense amount of respect for him. Uh, he's fought for gay rights. He founded the It Gets Better Project, and I think that he's done so much great things for the gay community. But this article is not acceptable. I disagree with it wholeheartedly, so let me tell you why. So, Dan states, I'm for Hillary, or Bernie, or both Hillary and Bernie, or Bernie and Hillary, and I disagreed with her on marriage equality then, but I am capable of taking yes for a motherfucking answer now. A lot of progressives are slamming Hillary for her past position on marriage equality, and the rather noxious comments she made back then, which, again, are similar to rather noxious comments made by most Dems at the time, including Barack Obama. You're right, so both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton made similar comments, but there is a significant difference between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. You see, Barack Obama, he only talked the talk when it comes to homophobia, but he didn't actually walk the walk. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, she actually did walk the walk. She lobbied for Don't Ask, Don't Tell. She lobbied for DOMA policies that demonstrably harmed the gay community. Yes, much like Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama had to evolve on the issue, but when he got in office, he made up for it. He pushed to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. He moved the entire party towards the position of marriage equality. He was a leader on that position. What did Hillary Clinton do? Nothing. See, she could have looked at the same public opinion polls we were all looking at and see the ongoing trend that, look, the country is going to be in favor of marriage equality. It's going to be majority pretty soon. And she could have been a leader. She could have spoken out and said, look, you know what? I'm going to run for president in 2016. Uh, I got to be a leader on this. Uh, so by the time I run, most likely a majority of people will be in favor of marriage equality. Guess what she, she chose to do? Nothing. So there's a difference between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Yes, they had the same position. Yes, they both evolved, but it's a lot more complicated than that. So uh, I'm going to let Dan Savage continue because he wants to now attack straight people. So he says, and you know what? Most of the people I see out there hammering away at this, most of them, not all of them, are straight. 
oh, there are queer folks doing it too, but it's mostly straight people and man, they are losing their patience with queers who support Hillary Clinton. See, this is a neat little trick he's trying to do here. I see it all the time. So he's trying to delegitimize straight supporters of LGBT rights and say, look, you're straight, you're not gay, so you don't get to speak out on LGBT issues. You don't get to speak out on our behalfs. See, I appreciate the fact that you fought for us, you know, with marriage equality and whatnot. You were right there with us. But now that I disagree with you, you have to shut up, straight people. I didn't think I'd ever have to say this, but Dan Savage, did you know that being straight is not a choice? Just like gay people, they are allowed to have their own opinions on issues, and I would encourage them to have their own opinions on issues when it comes to LGBT rights, because they're our allies. They were right there with us. If it wasn't for them and their support, them marching right alongside us, then we wouldn't have marriage equality. We wouldn't have any protections when it comes to anti-discrimination measures by each state and whatnot. Now, we still have a lot of work to do, but I'm sorry, but I'm not going to tell straight people that they can't talk about gay rights issues. I want them to because they're our allies. They're looking out for us and their intentions are good. So why would you try to delegitimize them because you disagree with them? I find that incredibly wrong. But I'm going to get to the crux of his argument. So he says, to those who can't understand why any gay person could possibly support Hillary, we're taking motherfucking yes for a motherfucking answer. It's fucking moronic. It's political malpractice to attack a politician for coming around on your issues. Why should they come around on our issues? Why should they switch sides or change their votes if we're going to go after them hammer and tongs for the positions they used to hold? Please change your mind and support us. No, pretty please? Okay, I've changed my mind and I'll vote to support you. Fuck you for not always agreeing with me. I'm not voting for you. Fuck you some more. Queer people who are doing this, we're fucking ourselves with this shit. Not Clinton. Stop it. Straight people who are doing this, you may be hurting Clinton, but you're also hurting the queers you claim to care so much about. Stop it. See, we're entitled to our opinions. You don't get to police people that you disagree with. You can present your argument, but to say that it's fucking moronic, in your own words, for us to criticize Hillary Clinton, that's wrong. And we shouldn't have to beg people. We shouldn't have to drag their feet to get them to come along with us. You see, they're accountable to us. They're politicians. But if they weren't there with us all along, then maybe they're not really our allies. Maybe we should consider that. Now, the biggest reason why we get to criticize Hillary Clinton is because it's not just because she evolved or that she didn't do anything to fight for us. It's because she's claiming that she's been there all along. She's now touting herself as the civil rights hero. She's taking her endorsement from the human rights campaign, actually their board of directors, as an endorsement from the entire gay community. She's taking it as tacit forgiveness from the entire gay community, absolving her of any homophobic policies that she pushed for. I don't accept that. Sorry. Uh, if you're going to be a gay rights ally now, great. But don't try to lie to us and pretend that you were there all along. You know what that's called? That's called pandering. That's what politicians love to do. And for those of us who are pointing it out, we're paying attention. We're not moronic. In fact, we're the smarter ones here. Now, the worst part is that Dan Savage didn't just make this argument. He had to take it a step further and attack Bernie Sanders' gay rights history. And these are all debunked attacks. I've talked about them on my show. So uh, one of the things he said was that Bernie Sanders was not very good on marriage equality. So he supported it as a states' rights issue only. And furthermore, he was against marriage equality in Vermont after they passed civil unions. Now, these claims are bullshit. So when it comes to the states' rights issue, he was in favor of marriage equality as far back as the 80s. Now, the reason why he said it was a states' rights issue was for political expediency. Jane O'Mara Sanders stated that they said this so that way they can try to lure some Republicans who are libertarian and get them on board with the marriage equality decision and get them to stop being so homophobic. So they said that, yes, uh, but it was for very practical reasons. Now, furthermore, what he doesn't tell you about Bernie Sanders saying that he wasn't in favor of marriage equality in Vermont was that they just had a long, hard-fought battle for civil unions. And the reason why he didn't want to push for marriage equality is because they barely got civil unions. So he thought that by trying to push the envelope further, that would undo the progress that they made. But the most important part is that Bernie Sanders was still in favor of marriage equality altogether. He was still in favor of it philosophically. So even though he said he didn't want to push for it politically at that time, he still was there with us. Now, I don't care what Bernie Sanders said. I've made this point before. In the 1980s, he signed a day declaring Gay Rights Pride Day in Burlington, Vermont when he was the mayor. He actually got anti-discrimination legislation for LGBT people codified into law. 
These things are really, really important. And he almost destroyed his career because of the city council was after him. They did not like this. Nobody wanted to stand up for us. Certainly not straight people. But Bernie Sanders was there all along. So, yeah, we can point to the objective truth that Bernie Sanders is way better than Hillary Clinton. But here's why that's not even what matters. When we bring up the fact that Hillary Clinton is worse than Bernie Sanders on LGBT rights, we're highlighting a continuous trend with Hillary Clinton. See, I'm not a one-issue voter. I'm not going to vote based on gay rights. But here's the thing. Hillary Clinton has always been behind Bernie Sanders. He's always been more progressive than her. He's always been on the right side of every issue. So, for example, she was wrong on the Iraq War. Bernie was right. Gay rights. She was wrong. Bernie was right. The Keystone XL pipeline. He was right first. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He was right there first against it. Uh, when it comes to lifting the cap on Social Security, she was just against it in October. And now all of a sudden she's in favor of it. Guess who said it first? Bernie Sanders said it first. So when it comes to issues like uh, legalizing marijuana, the Syrian no-fly zone, universal health care now, Bernie Sanders is on the right side and Hillary Clinton is on the wrong side. See, I'm sick and tired of, of begging Hillary Clinton, of trying to drag her feet towards the direction of progression. Maybe I want a president who's just objectively better. Maybe I feel like I need to point out the fact that voters should know that Hillary Clinton is always wrong first before she gets it right on an issue. So sure, she's a progressive. <laughs> Yay, kudos to you, you've evolved. Congratulations, Hillary Clinton. When are you actually gonna be right the first time around? Has that ever happened? I just wanna know, when is Hillary Clinton going to get it right the first time? So I reject this smug, pretentious article. Cause Dan Savage, I'm guessing that he's upper middle class at a, at a minimum. So he doesn't know what it's like to actually really have to search for these discernible di differences between candidates. See. Hillary's in favor of a $12 minimum wage. Bernie's in favor of a $15 minimum wage. When you are barely getting by, that $3 is life-changing. When you are underinsured and if you get sick, you have to pay a $5,000 deductible and you're worried about that, universal health care can literally save your life. If you are struggling to put your kids through college and you're saving every penny, college-free tuition can change your life. So no, it, I reject the claim that Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are very similar. They are different enough to where it would be life-changing. And even if Bernie Sanders gets in and he has a Republican Congress that doesn't want to work with him, at least he's pushing the envelope. He's moving the party in the right direction, just like Obama did with marriage equality. Do you think any Democrat would have the spine to come out and support marriage equality if Obama didn't do it? No way. So we need a true progressive. Sorry, but Hillary Clinton, not a true progressive. So I reject this article. I disagree wholeheartedly with it. If you're wondering why the mainstream media appears biased in favor of Hillary Clinton and is against Bernie Sanders, well, there's a real reason for that. There's so many conflict of interest going on that have not been disclosed. So last week, I told you about how the Daily Beast has a conflict of interest with the Clinton campaign. And this week, uh, The Intercept's Lee Fang did an article revealing a bunch of undisclosed conflict of interest in the mainstream media uh, with a bunch of pundits. So he states, several consultants who work at firms retained by Hillary Clinton's campaign and her affiliated super PACs appear regularly on the major television networks frequently touting Clinton. Stephanie Cutter, for example, has appeared on multiple networks to discuss Clinton. What hasn't been disclosed in any of her appearances reviewed by The Intercept, however, is that the boutique consulting firm she co-founded, Precision Strategies, has been retained by the Clinton campaign for digital consulting according to the Federal Election Commission records. Precision Strategies has been paid at least $120,000 from the Clinton campaign since June of last year. Now listen to the way that she talks about Hillary Clinton and I'll let you decide if she's biased. Uh, Hillary Clinton has done everything right. She has run a good campaign. She has uh, outperformed in debates. She's raised money. She's got a great gr ground game. But what she can't control is this uh, string of anger that is connecting both parties right now. It's what's given rise to Trump, Here, and it's what's what given rise to Sanders. Say, that's Pretty obvious, right? Now, he continues. Maria Cardona, a CNN contributor, has appeared on a regular basis over the course of the presidential campaign as a reliable voice in support of Clinton. She is also a longtime partner at the Dewey Square Group, a lobbying firm with extensive ties to the Clinton campaign. 
Two Dewey Square partners serve as fundraisers for the Clinton campaign, each raising at least $100,000, both pro-Clinton super PACs. Priorities USA, Action, and Correct the Record have paid Dewey Square for consulting services during this election, and the co-founding partner of Dewey Square now serves as the chief administrative officer of the Clinton campaign. Notably, Cardona, a DNC superdelegate who pledged support for Clinton last year before any of the primary elections, also contributed the maximum donation to Clinton's campaign. Now, here's why this is troubling. The Intercept reviewed transcripts for 50 television segments from August 2015 through this month, in which Cardona has appeared on to CNN to discuss. In five of those appearances, she was identified or identified herself as a supporter of Clinton. In another five, she, she identified herself as someone who advised Clinton during the 2008 campaign. The other 40 appearances presented her as a neutral Democratic strategist or CNN contributor, and in none of her appearances was it disclosed that her firm, the Dewey Square Group, has been retained for consulting work by the Clinton Super PAC. Now, here's a video of her talking about Hillary Clinton. As a Latina, I can tell you that Latinos all over the country are very excited about Hillary. Latina women are very excited about Hillary. And she has a great and, and long and robust relationship with Latinos. And that's what she's going to be underscoring moving forward. Last one for you here. So Hari Savugan is a principal at 270 Strategies, which was co-founded by Linda Tran, a CBS News political contributor. 270 Strategies boasts on the homepage of its website of its extensive work for the Clinton campaign. 270 Strategies worked with the Ready for Clinton team to develop their organizing approach and provided guidance on their volunteer engagement program. The website notes detailing work on behalf of a pro-Clinton super PAC that later folded into a larger Clinton campaign. FEC records show that Ready for Hillary paid 270 Strategies $300,000 for consulting work and later, the Hillary for America campaign paid the firm at least $75,000. Now, both Tran and Savugan downplayed Bernie Sanders' uh, performance in Iowa. Take a look. It's not just about outcomes, it's also about expectations. And actually, I think the expectations were pretty high for Bernie heading mm -hmm. into Iowa last night. All of the polls showed that it was essentially a statistical tie, as it ended up being, um, ultimately. But also, uh, he, he's had so much momentum behind him. What he really needed was to absolutely win last night. Everybody expects him to win in New Hampshire. In fact, the stakes are really high for him there. We'll see if he pulls out this sort of 20-point victory that the poll suggests that he's going to do. So there you have it. Uh, he also brought up how there's people shilling for Jeb Bush as well, but I mean, he's out of the campaign, so we won't talk about him. Uh, but I mean, the Hillary Clinton campaign, they have their hands in every single cookie jar and every single media outlet, and it's just disgusting. When you watch a news segment now, you can't just think that they're being objective. You actually have to question their interior motives and question whether or not they actually have financial ties to the Clinton campaign, because it's been the case in multiple instances that they're incredibly biased because there's a conflict of interest. Again, I told you about the Daily Beast. Clinton's uh, daughter, Chelsea Clinton, serves on the board of IAC, the owner of the Daily Beast, and they've been releasing a bunch of pro-Clinton propaganda. So this is really, really frustrating that uh, we don't get objectivity because they're all corrupt. They're all in bed with Hillary Clinton, and that's disgusting, but kudos to Lee Fang of The Intercept. The Intercept is the one true investigative journalism outlet that actually... <laughs> that actually gets stuff done, that actually informs readers. So phenomenal piece, uh, great expose. In a surprising turn of events, the editorial board of the New York Times actually wrote an article criticizing Hillary Clinton. They urged her to release her speech transcripts that she gave to Wall Street. Let me repeat that. Mainstream media criticized Hillary Clinton. They say everybody does it is an excuse expected from a mischievous child, not a presidential candidate. But that is Hillary Clinton's latest defense for making closed-door, richly paid speeches to big banks, which many middle-class Americans still blame for their economic pain, and then refusing to release the transcripts. Okay, so they're taking a strong stance. They want her to release her transcripts. They continue. Voters have every right to know what Mrs. Clinton told these groups. Republicans make no bones about their commitment to Wall Street deregulation and tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. Mrs. Clinton is laboring to convince struggling Americans that she will rein in big banks despite taking their money. Besides, Mrs. Clinton is not running against a Republican in the Democratic primaries. She's running against Bernie Sanders, a decades-long critic of Wall Street excess who is hardly a hot ticket on the industry-speaking circuit. 
<laughs> and let me tell you something. There's a reason why he's not a hot ticket on the industry speaking circuit. It's because they don't want to hear what he has to say. See, if you think that Wall Street is going to actually pay someone to come and tell them that they need to be broken up and that they're criminals and that their executives need to be jailed, uh, they're not going to want to pay for you. In fact, they're going to pay to make you go away. So the reason why Hillary Clinton doesn't want to release her speech transcripts is because obviously she told them a lot of great things they wanted to hear. She probably made some promises that are very problematic in the eyes of the American people. And there's a reason why her speeches were so great. They paid her not once, not twice, but three times to hear her speak. So, yeah, I think that we deserve to know what's in the speech transcripts. I got one more quote for you from the New York Times. Public interest in these speeches is legitimate, and it is the public, not the candidate, who decides how much disclosure is enough. By stonewalling on these transcripts, Mrs. Clinton plays into the hands of those who say she's not trustworthy and makes her own rules. Most important, she is damaging her credibility among Democrats who are begging her to show them that she'd run an accountable and transparent White House. So with the Obama uh, campaign, he promised to have the most transparent administration in the history of administrations. Now, we've, we, we know that's a lie. We know that that's absolutely false. But Hillary Clinton, she's not even promising to have a transparent campaign. She's saying, not only am I not going to be transparent when I'm president. I'm not even going to be transparent during the campaign. See, you don't even get to know everything there is to know about me before you vote for me. You get to just make your decision in the dark. Well, guess what, Hillary? That's not the way this works. You're accountable to us. So if you want our vote, you do what we want. We're telling you to release the transcripts. So release the transcripts. We deserve to know what you told to Goldman Sachs. Did you sell them a rose garden? Did you make big promises? What did you tell them? It proves to us that you said something really bad. I bet you made some really, really big promises that you're not going to be able to keep. So the reason why you don't want to release them is because of this. So release the transcripts, whatever's in there, good or bad, we deserve to know. And as a Democrat, you should hold yourself to a higher standard than the Republican Party. You're trying to lower the bar and say that you're going to set yourself to the same low standard as Republicans, really? And then expect us to vote for you? Well, why, don't, why wouldn't we just vote for one of the Republicans? They're just as corrupt, right? I mean, they've completely sold out to corporate interests. They're corporate fascists. And the Democratic Party has effectively done that as well. You're one of the worst to perpetuate that because you've taken money from everyone, your hands in every single cookie jar in the country. But you're running for president with that being said. So we deserve to know what you told them. Release the transcripts. David Brock is a Hillary Clinton surrogate and head of multiple pro-Clinton super PACs, and this is an individual who has slandered and attacked Bernie Sanders left and right. Now, he had the audacity to write an open letter to Bernie Sanders and begged him to stop attacking Hillary Clinton. I'm not joking. So here's what he had to say. Dear Senator Sanders, I'm writing today to urge that you and your campaign immediately halt all negative campaigning against our party's prospective candidate for the presidency, Secretary Hillary Clinton. At first, pledging to wage a positive campaign for president, you and your campaign have for weeks now engaged in a relentlessly ugly barrage of false character attacks against Mrs. Clinton, including running negative TV advertising of the sort you promised you never would. Following the Nevada caucuses, you had the opportunity to live up to the self-professed ideals of your own campaign by delivering an aspirational message of systemic change, but instead, you chose to ramp up spurious negative attacks against the winner of those caucuses, these attacks ranging from baseless insinuations that Mrs. Clinton is somehow compromised in her ability to support meaningful reform in the financial sector when her record shows the opposite bullshit, to unfairly impugning her reputation as a true progressive, despite her 40 years of committed, passionate advocacy, must cease. Now, the one attack you can say that Bernie Sanders does on Hillary Clinton is that he points out that she takes large contributions from Wall Street. That's not an attack. That's a fact. And if you have a problem with a fact and you think it's an attack, that says more about Hillary Clinton than it does about Bernie Sanders. Now, let's remember that Hillary Clinton has outright slandered Bernie Sanders. She's referred to him as a sexist, as a racist. She's gotten Bill to compare his supporters to the Tea Party. Uh, she has Chelsea Clinton outright lying about his policy. You said that Bernie Sanders doesn't care about black people because one of his ads wasn't diverse enough. So you want to go ahead and have this double standard. You want to attack. But when 
Bernie Sanders hit you back, you want to go run and cry like a little baby. Now, here's why he says that uh, Bernie Sanders should not attack Hillary Clinton. Your continued suggestions that Mrs. Clinton is untrustworthy and even corrupt when nothing could be further from the truth are a threat to our party standing up and down the November ballot, with Mrs. Clinton now universally recognized as the leading candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination. How pretentious. At this juncture, by staying negative, all you are doing is helping Karl Rove and his ilk do their general election dirty work. The irony here is overwhelming. I mean, they do all these attacks on Bernie Sanders, but they don't want him to point out facts about Hillary Clinton, that she's taking money from Wall Street. Look, here's the thing. The fact that we think Hillary Clinton is corrupt and bought off, he didn't flip a switch in our head and get us to think, whoa, she is corrupt. I, I would have never saw that. The reason why we think she's untrustworthy and corrupt is because we have brains. We're paying attention. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is follow the money. Even if you don't really follow politics as much as I do or my viewers do, well, even if you just tune into a debate and you see the way that Hillary Clinton is unwilling to release her paid Goldman Sachs speech transcripts under any circumstance, shows you that she's probably ha ha she probably has something to hide. She's a bad candidate. Was it Bernie Sanders who started the email scandal? No, I don't think he's the one that told the FBI to start investigating her. That's not the case. Hillary Clinton does these things that are seemingly corrupt. So I'm sorry that we have a brain and that uh, we've been betrayed once by politicians and we're pretty skeptical about Hillary Clinton, a candidate who's taking millions of dollars from all these industries that we dislike, such as the health insurance industry, the private prison industry, Wall Street, I'm sorry, but she did that on her own. Let me ask you this, David. Would a trustworthy non-corrupt candidate refuse to release the transcripts of paid private speeches she gave to Goldman Sachs? Don't think so. Would a trustworthy candidate tell us that she wants to end mass incarceration yet simultaneously take money from the private prison industry? Would a trustworthy candidate take millions of dollars from Wall Street and then tell us that she's going to regulate them and promise that she's going to regulate them? Of course not. And look, I can go on all day. The reason why Hillary Clinton is viewed as untrustworthy it's because of Hillary Clinton, not Bernie Sanders. How about this, David Brock? Here's my open letter to you. Why don't you stop being a hypocrite and take your own advice? Stop attacking Bernie Sanders. And then maybe you can actually ask him to stop attacking Hillary Clinton. But in actuality, he's not really attacking Hillary Clinton. To point out a fact, again, if you don't like the facts, then you don't like your candidate. Let's talk about the CNN Telemundo debate. So when it comes to who won... This is tough for me. Um, I thought that both Donald Trump and Marco Rubio performed exceptionally well. I would probably give the edge to Donald Trump. I think that Marco Rubio had a lot of great moments in the debate. He was a lot stronger. He came off as a lot less robotic this time. But I think Donald Trump won, and I I'm going to tell you why. So the reason why Donald Trump won is because whenever he actually got the crowd worked up, it was more genuine. When Marco Rubio got the crowd worked up, they seemed really overly enthusiastic, right? And Donald Trump pointed out the fact that there are special interests and lobbyists in the audience who are rah, 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 Marco Rubio. So everything he says, you have this huge overreaction, even for things that weren't that great. I mean, he had some great moments. Like when he said that Donald Trump repeats himself, he says, we're going to win, we're going to build a wall. That was a great moment. And it was absolutely true. That's something that I criticized Donald Trump for. But I mean, some of the other moments just an overreaction from the crowd, and you could really tell that that wasn't genuine enthusiasm. That was the establishment shills trying to uh, hype up Marco Rubio and make it appear as though he's generating a lot more excitement, when in actuality, Donald Trump is the one who's, dominate, who's dominating in terms of excitement. I mean, he's crushing them. He won by a landslide in New Hampshire and Nevada and uh, South Carolina. He's steamrolling through the primaries right now. I mean, He's basically unstoppable at this point. So don't try to tell me that people aren't uh, inclined to hear what Donald Trump says and that, they're, that the message that he's saying isn't resonating with them. That's BS. So Donald Trump is correct to point out that Marco Rubio has a bunch of people from the establishment in the audience cheering for him. Now, it was basically the anti-Donald Trump show. We had predominantly Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz going back and forth attacking Donald Trump. But a lot of the attacks that they did on Donald Trump, I don't think they're going to work. They were basically pro-Trump attacks. Like, uh, Ted Cruz literally attacked Donald Trump for saying that he wouldn't allow citizens to die in this country. He literally attacked him for this. Donald Trump didn't concede to a Medicare for All system, but he said, I'm not going to allow anyone to die as president. And Ted Cruz attacked him for it. 
Oh my god, I've never seen anything so idiotic, so stupid in my entire life. Ted Cruz, he's bought off, so when he talks, he's talking for his donors, he's talking for the billionaires that fund his campaign, he's talking for the health insurance industry when Donald Trump, he doesn't take their money. He tried to get their money, but they didn't want to give it to him, but he, he's a self-financed candidate. So he's not beholden to these corporate interests. That's why his message is resonating, that and the racism. Uh, but there's a really huge populist message to Donald Trump when it comes to him being anti-establishment, to him hating Republicans, or excuse me, to him hating politicians more generally. Uh, and these guys don't know how to respond to that. They don't know how to be uh, less robotic like Ted Cruz. Everything he says is robotic and rehearsed. Marco Rubio, same thing. Uh, this time, thankfully, thankfully, he toned that down. Now, another thing I wanted to address was um, Ben Carson. He consistently whines about not getting time, but dude, this is a debate. You have to chime in if you want to get time. And the moment when he said, can someone please attack me? I know he was just, you know, being tongue in cheek, but that was basically his please clap moment of the campaign like Jeb Bush. Uh, dude, you have to jump in. You're just not assertive. He's someone who's not presidential, and he's got to be dropping out pretty soon, right? I mean, you can't continue to go on if you're not going to win. Uh, John Kasich, he's someone who is logical by Republican standards. We all know that, you know, he's a crook and that he basically gutted welfare in Ohio. But, you know, with respect to everyone else, he's a moderate. He has a moderate stance when it comes to marriage equality. He has a moderate stance when it comes to immigration. Uh, but... That's his downfall. <laughs> You've got a crazy right-wing base who want blood. They're blaming all their problems on minorities, on Muslims, on uh, Mexicans and whatnot. Uh, and Kasich is not typing into that because he's smart enough to know that that's going to hurt him in the general. Nobody else is smart enough to discern that fact. Now, a really important point was brought up. So Donald Trump would not win the Latino vote in a general election. I don't think that would be the case. Uh, but could he still win the general unlike Mitt Romney, even if he doesn't have the um, Latino vote. If he's up against Bernie Sanders, he'd, he'd get his ass whooped. But if he's up against Hillary Clinton, I mean, think about this. Turnout for Democratic primaries uh, like Nevada are low, lower than in 2008. And if young people don't get out to vote uh, to support the Democratic Party, if independents end up flocking over to Donald Trump, an anti-establishment candidate, this could be detrimental for the Democrats. Uh, come November. But in the same respect, I don't necessarily think that Donald Trump has it wrapped up if Hillary does become the nominee and he be, uh, becomes the nominee because he's anti-establishment. Hillary Clinton is clearly uh, pro-establishment. So I think that you would have a lot of right-wing donors migrate over to Hillary Clinton's campaign and try to bankroll her and try to help her and push her uh, to the presidency because they don't want Donald Trump. I mean, he might be a billionaire and most likely he's going to get in and, you know, give more tax cuts to billionaires and whatnot. But they they can't predict that. He's saying some things that are populist. He's saying things on foreign policy that are to the left of Hillary Clinton. Like he's staying neutral on the Israel and Palestine conflict. Hillary Clinton's taken aside. I mean, he is against intervening, uh, you know, abroad. And look, with Libya, of course, it was the case that he said that we should topple the Qaddafi regime or something of that likes. He like he supported uh, intervention in Libya, but he's he's not saying that now. And I think that for a lot of people who are still frustrated that the Iraq war is still going on, that could resonate in the general. So Donald Trump at this point is unstoppable. So in terms of the debate, I think he probably had the edge, but I don't think it even matters at this point. No matter what happens to the debates, Donald Trump might just steamroll his way to the nomination. That's the episode. I want to thank all of my viewers for tuning in every single week and welcome all of my newest subscribers to the channel. We are well on our way to 20,000 subscribers and the the rate that we're growing is just mind-blowing to me. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. I really appreciate all the kind words that everyone is leaving. Um, so thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next week. At this time, most of the results from Super Tuesday are in, and ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to say that we have a race. So, uh, getting to the numbers here, Bernie Sanders managed to win not just Vermont, he won Oklahoma, Minnesota, and Colorado as well, 
and he came within three points in Massachusetts. So when it comes to the delegate count in Massachusetts, it appears as though Hillary Clinton will be taking 61, while Bernie Sanders will be taking 42 from Massachusetts, uh, and she does still have an overall delegate lead. So this doesn't make Bernie Sanders the front runner at all, but it does mean that he is still absolutely viable. Now, one thing that's interesting is in Vermont, Hillary Clinton, at this point, with 83% of the vote uh, reported in, she only got 14% of Vermont, and I believe you have to have 15%. So if she can't pass that threshold of 15%, I believe she's non-viable and she doesn't get any delegates. That would be awesome if that were the case. Now, Hillary Clinton won a total of seven states. Um, there's, there's no surprise there. We knew she was going to do great in the South. She is... She's doing a great job when it comes to states that Democrats will not capture in the general election. Now, getting to the Republicans, it looks like Ted Cruz actually performed a lot better. So he won uh, two states, and Marco Rubio actually won a state. He won Minnesota. So, buddy, you're in the race. Welcome. I mean, you finally came there. Now, of course, uh, when we get to the numbers here, Ben Carson got absolutely steamrolled in every state, but um, not too well. John Kasich also got steamrolled. Uh, so at this point, I would not be surprised if John Kasich and or Ben Carson drop out relatively soon, perhaps after March 15th, maybe they'll stick around. It doesn't make sense uh, unless you have a significant sum of money to keep going. Now, Donald Trump still did a phenomenal job. And at this point, he's doing great. Ted Cruz needed a couple of wins to stay viable and uh, I think he did that. So we do still have a competition between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. So now getting back to the Democratic race, which is the one that I care more about, you're going to watch the mainstream media tomorrow and they're going to basically say, oh, wash your hands, Bernie Sanders. It's over. You know, this confirms it. He's done. But that's not the case. We have a real race. When you take into account the fact that he raised $40 million in February, when you take into the account that getting into the uh, forthcoming states, not all of them, but a lot of them favor Bernie Sanders, it is not over for Bernie Sanders. I told you guys this after Nevada, don't get demoralized. The election is heating up. It's going to be a long race. Now, that doesn't guarantee Bernie Sanders is going to win. Hillary Clinton is still the front runner just because she has more delegates. But it's not over yet, and if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, you should feel really encouraged after tonight, because if you walked away with just Vermont, it'd be terrible. I mean, the momentum would be so high for Hillary Clinton, he may not have been able to overcome that. Uh, if you walked away with two states, again, uh, <laughs> it'd be better than uh, only getting one, but not very good. He walked away with four states, and when it comes to Massachusetts, a really important state, he came within three percentage points. That's really, really important. What I think that we should be excited about is the fact that Bernie Sanders did really well. All he needed to do was pull out some victories. He needed to stay alive until we get out of Clinton territory and get into Bernie Sanders territory, which is the other states that haven't gone yet. But when we get into the more Bernie territory, we have a really big chance of coming up. So look, this is gonna be a really long race. This isn't gonna be wrapped up quickly, but here's the thing. Uh, this race will be over if we lose our momentum, if we become demoralized, if we become complacent. You still have to donate. Anytime the media talks shit about Bernie Sanders, make it a, instead of a drinking game, make it a donating game. So if you see a media pundit telling uh, you that Hillary Clinton is officially inevitable due to Super Tuesday results, you donate five bucks to him or a dollar to him, whatever you can. Make it a game. Now, also, there's still the electability myth. A new poll came out today showing that Hillary Clinton loses to Ted Cruz when uh, Bernie Sanders beats him by double digits. I believe it was 17%. Uh, so the electability myth, it's not going to go away until Bernie Sanders overtakes her in delegates and does become the official frontrunner. Uh, but the mainstream media doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, and that's evidenced by the fact that they still think that Hillary Clinton is more electable than Bernie Sanders. They're going to say he should drop out. They're going to say that uh, he's not viable. They're going to say that, you know, Hillary Clinton is now inevitable because she won more states on Super Tuesday than Bernie Sanders. While that's true, the race is not over. It's going to be a really, really long race. And again, Get excited about this. You could be optimistic now. Oh, we're still in this. I mean, tonight could have been a death blow. It wasn't. In fact, I think Bernie Sanders performed better than a lot of us even thought that he would. So we should all give ourselves a pat on the back, not just for breaking fundraising records and now helping him raise $40 million. $40 million. He doesn't have a super back. He's not taking money from corporations and Wall Street. He raised $40 million. That's you. So this is a great night overall. Uh, if you're upset, 
don't be get excited celebrate for once because this has been a, a pretty rough couple of weeks for us we lost nevada we lost south carolina but now we did really great in super tuesday a lot better than people thought and expectations are what matters a lot of the times in races and bernie sanders surpassed a lot of people's expectations again silence the noise that you're going to hear from the mainstream media it's inevitable that they're going to say hillary clinton is inevitable again but we already know that's bullshit. the race is just getting started it's going to go on for a while It is officially Super Tuesday, and with entrance polls showing that Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are really, really close when it comes to Massachusetts, what does Bill Clinton decide to do? Well, he decides to go to Massachusetts and violate a ton of laws. Now, when it comes to voting regulations, the Secretary of Commonwealth reads that candidates cannot campaign within 150 feet of a polling place. No person shall solicit votes for or against or otherwise promote or oppose any person or political party or position on a ballot question to be voted on at the current election. Uh, now, in addition, uh, campaign operatives are prohibited from distributing campaign material intended to influence the vote of a voter in the ongoing election within 150 feet of a polling location. Now, Bill Clinton has gone into two polling locations in Massachusetts. Here's a picture of one of them here. And now this wouldn't be a problem if he was just standing there and not doing anything. But according to Boston Magazine, um, Bill took one photo with a voter outside Holy Name, which is a polling location. He kissed an elderly woman on her hand and signed another voter's Hillary sign. The Globe also reports that Clinton told one voter, pull the lever for Hillary. That is against the law. Now, when it comes to the 150 feet polling requirement, you can't get within 150 feet. Uh, well, here's a video of Bill Clinton outside of what is a polling location. This isn't confirmed, just know that. But this is allegedly a polling location where Bill Clinton is clearly within 150 feet. Thank you all for being here. Can you reach up and snap Thank you all for participating. Thank you. All you have to do is hit the circle. I especially thank those of you who are supporting Hillary Clinton. Now, additionally, uh, there are multiple videos surfacing that um, him and his security motorcade and whatnot are blocking polling locations so that way voters in Massachusetts cannot get to the polls. Here's videos of this. I haven't seen one person be able to come in and be able to vote in here. It's completely blocked off. No cars can park here. They are affecting the voting at this poll. This is super fraud and illegal. From one side of the street to the other, there's no way anybody can get down here. My dad would never make it to this poll in this city. This is ridiculous. Blocking the voting poll. Blocking the voting poll. A great friend of New Bedford. A place whose aspirations are those just like every other place in America. A great president and a husband of a soon-to-be great president. So all of these alleged accusations, if true, would constitute a violation of the law. This is voter fraud. But what will be the penalty for Bill Clinton if this is the case? Nothing. The Clinton machine has proven that they are willing to win no matter what it takes, even if that means violating voter laws. Now, the reason why we don't allow candidates to uh, campaign within 150 feet or within polling stations is because they have to be, there has to be secrecy. Like in authoritarian regimes, you see ballot stuffing, you see intimidation at the polling places. And this is why in democracies, we don't allow this to take place. We don't allow candidates to influence the votes. Now, I'm not saying he's intimidating voters, but you're not allowed to have an influence over the voters. But we see here, Bill Clinton willing to break the law. So again, these are just allegations. They are not confirmed as of yet. We, we saw the evidence. That's what we have. Uh, make your own conclusion based on that. But it does not look good for Bill and Hillary Clinton. However, nothing will come of this. There will be absolutely uh, no penalties imposed on them for this. And if there is, then I will be completely shocked.